All right, hey, what's up, guys? Coach Mack, play fast football. All right, today we're going to take a look at teaching tempo in your offense, and the reason I'm going to look at it today is I just got back from uh, the Nike Coach of the Year Clinic, and uh, Alex Golish, the head coach at USF that was at Tennessee last year and has been with Josh Heupel before, was there. Lane Kiffin was there, and, and guys talking about tempo and some different things, so I'm just going to go through and give my opinion on some of those things. Make sure you check out some of our partners, GameStrat, uh, sideline replay company we use at Bishop Kenny High School. I used them at the school I was previously at. If you're looking for highly reliable, highly affordable, great customer service, make sure you check out GameStrat. Dome Hats, the headwear company that we use at Bishop Kenny High School, I use with Play Fast Football. This is one of our fitted Bishop Kenny hats, right? So you can make it completely customizable. You can build a hat. Every hat has a story. Make sure you're using Dome to tell yours. Baker Sporting Goods, company we use for some of our sideline gear, coaches gear, shirts like this that have been worn around and dirty and, and things that I wear in practice and in the weight room. And then our sideline gear for game nights. Our uniforms are distributed by them. So if you're looking for everything in one spot, check out Baker Sports. Just Play, which is the playbook software that we use. A lot of our presentations, team meetings, other things that we're doing uh, uh, within our playbook and, and uh, overall team meetings, offensive meetings, special teams meetings. We use Just Play as our playbook software. Best play drawing tool on the market. I use it for my Patreon site, any clinics that I do. So I highly recommend Just Play. Different USA, the ultimate strike machine. You get thousands of reps without needing a partner. Elbows in, thumbs up. They attach right on the racks in your weight room if you want them in the weight room. You could set up uh, places on the field where, where they could be set up if you wanted to do it in season. So they're perfect for off season, in season, get all the striking reps you need, work on the technique. Uh, they, they have different coils that change the tension of the pad le leveraging in. So as kids get older, you can change the tension. So easy tool to use, uh, easy product for in season, off season. So if you're looking to improve your striking skills, make sure you check out Difference USA. So like I said, um, the, I was at the Nike Coach of the Year clinic in uh, this weekend in Orlando, and it just so happened that some of the coaches that were there were big tempo guys, right? I've always been, uh, the last 10 to 15 years, I have been uh, a tempo offense, exactly what that means sometimes. I think it's a little bit misconstrued, but offenses that want to operate very fast, uh, I think within the tempo world, all these teams change tempos. I don't think they play that way every snap of the game, which is sometimes a misconception. But they have the oper the, oper the ability, sorry, and they use the opportunity to play at warp speed, hyper fast, a lot. And it's the communication that they use. It's the mindset that they're, that they're trying to build. And the thing that I found interesting is when you hear these guys talk about it, what they mention is, hey, you know, we can't get the same players that Alabama, Georgia, Clemson get, Ohio State. So we have to find another way to be competitive. And I'm thinking, all right, well, in the high school world, we can't even recruit, okay, or at least we're not supposed to recruit, right? So in a high school world, you're dealing with a roster, and in my 22 years of being a head coach in high school, I'm dealing with a roster that I don't even control until they get to me as ninth graders, right? I don't even know until they enroll at my school or until I see them maybe the summer of their eighth grade going into ninth grade year. I don't even know who my guys are. So if these teams that can go out there and actively recruit at very, very good to great academic and athletic institutions in the SEC or the ACC or wherever it may be, if they can't get the guys they need to compete with Alabama and Georgia, when they can go out and actively find what they're looking for, and if in LSU's case and Tennessee's case last year, and now Alex Golish is, is at USF as the head coach, but if you're at, at sorry, Ole Miss, if you're at Ole Miss and you're at Tennessee and you don't feel like you can get the guys to compete off the bus with Alabama and Georgia, well, then tempo for us in high school at probably 80% of the high schools across the country should be something that we're looking at because we don't even control our roster. We have nothing to do with what our roster is. It's kind of like you get dealt a hand and you got to play those cards, right? So their thing was, one of their, you know, one of their deals was we need – to find some type of competitive balance, and we think this is the way to do it, right? So what are they really trying to do, all right? Every one of them mentioned that they're trying to stress the defense, right? So we're trying to play, or at least have the ability to play at that warp speed, hyper speed, snap the ball every seven, eight seconds, as soon as it gets set ready for play and, and the referee backs out. A lot of mechanics that they're talking about, the, the how they do what they do is really what everybody wants to know, right? How do you play that fast? So a lot of mechanics involved, but they want to stress the defense. All right, they want to stress the alignment of the defense. They want to stress the conditioning of the defense. They want 
that defense to have to play when they're tired. So that's one of the things they're constantly looking to do. They want to stress the defense, right? There's multiple ways to stress the defense. There's people that try and stress the defense with formations. There's people that try and stress the defense with shifts and trades and motions, right? So this isn't the only way to stress it, but they all mention that that's one of the first things they're trying to do. They want to put as much stress as possible on the defense, right? They want to create simple pictures. So they want to get into formations with splits and, and tempo in their offense that makes it very simple for their quarterback and then some of their linemen. Now, the lineman part is not as simple as you think because they, they do what they do so well that it's hard to identify double teams and combos and ID mics because a lot of times guys aren't even lined up, right? That's the tough part. But they say that because of the splits that they're using and because of the tempo they're playing at, Defenses kind of show their hands a lot more often than they would if you were in the old-fashioned world of here's our formation, check with me, all right. Well, when I check, they might check, right? Not that they don't use check with me. They all play at different tempos. They all have four-minute offenses, right? They just have the ability to play. Their identity is they want to play at this warp hyper speed. And they said it creates simpler pictures for the quarterback. So if you're living in the RPO world or the drop-back pass or play-action world, the reads and everything should be simpler for the quarterback because the defense is stressed with splits and tempo that make them have to kind of show their hand a little bit more. All right, At least that's, if philosophy is the right word, I don't know, but philosophically that's what they're trying to do. Okay, They're trying to create matchups. And they said for them, a lot of times that's where all the coaching during the week is going on. The game plan of how do we create matchups. How do we get our best guy versus your less guy. That's where they say all their coaches because a lot of people will look at this and go, well, they, they, they really don't do all that much. They're not as multiple as they should be because the pace of what they're doing and, and the tempo of what they're doing, they have to kind of get things mainstreamed a little bit or they have to get things streamlined a little bit to be simpler so that they can play at that pace, right? So a lot of people would say maybe it's not multiple enough, it's not, you know, it's not dynamic enough. Well, we're, what they're saying is all their time is spent on finding and creating the right matchups. Right? We've got all this space that we're trying to create. We're trying to force guys to tackle good players in space. And we're trying to get matchups, especially in the passing game, where our best are on your less than best. Now, whether or not we're still better than that guy and we can win that matchup is still something that a lot of these offenses, when you see them, you know, until they have success against some really good programs and can start getting guys that can win those matchups, if you create the matchup you want and the other guy, your best, still loses to their less, well, you're probably in for a long night anyways, right? So creating the matchups is where they say they spend all their time and that's where, where other guys would be working on maybe formations and shifts and trades and motions and getting you know, the defense into precarious positions based on what they're doing formationally or, or motion or shifts. Or They say that they, they spend more of their time trying to create the matchup. What can we do that we think can get them into this matchup? So if we got a guy that can't beat press, well, maybe we're going to stack guys and we're going to put a, a better press player on the point and we're going to stack him behind so that it's tougher for teams to get hands on him because he doesn't handle the press really well. Or if he's not the greatest route runner, but he's a great vertical guy. Well, let's not try and force him to be a route runner when we can use him in our offense and all these vertical shots and let him do things that he's good at. Right? And that's another big point they all mentioned this week. Instead of talking about all the things that guys can't do, let's find what they can do and let's do the things that they can do and put them in, in places or, or positions to win. Right, So create those matchups. And then you get more snaps, which you have to have the ball on offense and you have to snap it to score. Right, So your job is to score on offense. We don't want to turn it over and let the defense score. Obviously the defense has a chance to score also, right, with turnovers. There was a scoop and score in the Super Bowl last night. But on offense, we can't score until we snap the ball. Well, the more we snap the ball, the more scoring opportunities we should have, right? So our mindset is, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> let's get as many snaps as we can because that's what creates scoring opportunities. None of these tempo teams ever worry about time of possession, all right? They're trying to create explosives. They're trying to create space. If they go three plays, in 48 seconds, like Oregon used to with Chip Kelly, and they score six points, who cares what the time of possession is, right? There's so many games you see, and, and Coach Golish, I believe it was Coach Golish, he had a game on there where it was 28 nothing, Tennessee, and the time of possession was like 14 minutes to 7 minutes 
not in their favor. But the score was 28 nothing. So that stat to tempo, guys, I think has always been kind of we don't care. That's not what we do. We want more snaps, and more snaps equal more scoring opportunities. Now, the problem in the tempo world, complementary football, if you're snapping the ball really fast and not getting first downs, all you're doing is giving the other, ball, the other team the ball really fast, and your defense isn't getting any rest. So eventually, if it's play as fast as we can to go three and out every time, now you're defeating the purpose. So, again, I'm not here to say that it's just the tempo and the snaps and this is everything. You still have to execute on those snaps, right? But they feel like how they play with their splits formationally and their tempo gives them a chance to execute better, right? So, you know, stress the defense, make them defend the entire width and length of the field, right? They've got to defend it 53 and a third, and they've got to defend it, you know, almost 120 yards if you want to look at it that way, all right? Or the 100-yard field, both end zones, so either 100, 120, however you want to look at it, and they've got to defend 53 and a third, all right, create simple pictures. Let's lay it out there so fast and so spread out that the pictures are a lot clearer to our quarterback. Create the matchups that they want, my best on your less, okay? And then get more snaps. More snaps equal more opportunities to score. Now, in the, like I said, the last 10, 15 years, we've always been a tempo team, but we've never been able to play that fast. And a couple things I think I picked up at this clinic that, that I would do differently, all right? And, and one of those things is, Every time they start a formation, you can't tempo somebody on the first snap of a drive, right? So what they like to do is they like to use motions and things that create stress on a defense that kind of give you the illusion of tempo. So maybe it's an unbalance, maybe it's a shift or a trade or a motion, right? So if they came out on the first snap and they put two stacked receivers to the left, okay, one receiver to the right, for them, and this is something that I would highly consider and do a little bit more of, most of the time you watch those drives that are being ripped at, at a truly unreal pace. There's really only two guys that are movement guys, right? If they come out in this stack set with these two receivers on the left, that receiver on the right, that entire drive, he's probably going to stay there and those two are going to stay there. If not stacked, they're going to stay somewhere in that vicinity. It's the tailback and that HY sniffer hybrid, whatever it is, those are oh, the, really the only two guys that are moving, right? The lineman's job is to constantly, the center's job is to get to where the ball is going to be put in play, and the other lineman's job is to line up on the center, right? So we have to line up. Guards know how to line up. Tackles know how to line up. But the interesting thing that they do, in my opinion, and this is going to be something that you have to determine whether or not you're okay with it, they teach all their players on offense, if you're not in the fight, don't run to get in the fight. In other words, if it's a run play that pops for 15 yards, once the old linemen are engaged in the original block, if the ball carrier is going 15 yards, they're not working and selling out to get to the ball and cover up downfield. If they're engaged and they're in the fight, they're going to stay in the fight. But if they're not engaged at the line of scrimmage and it's a pass or a run that goes 15 yards wide and deep, they're not really sprinting to the ball. So a lot of times it may get misconstrued that they're lazy. Well, what they're doing, all right, is, is they're actually trying to get to where the ball is going to be set. So if the ball was 15 yards down the field, on the left sideline, you'll see the linemen that aren't engaged and aren't in the fight, you'll see them running to about the spot where the ball is going to be placed in play, right? If it's a touchdown and the guy keeps running, then you'll see the offensive line running. But the receiver that's away from the play, you'll see him stay on his side. He won't even work to the football, right? So in the old days, we used to tell guys, hey, look, you know, where you are at the end of the play and, and what you're doing at the end of the play, that, that is your value to your teammates. That is how we judge you know, change of pace and loafs and all these other things. Well, their receiver at the bottom doesn't even work his way over to the battle if he's not involved because he's got to line up as quick as he can on that side again, right? So that's one of the things that I took from it that I would change with our guys. We were always trying to coach the attitude, effort, mentality of, hey, play hard, get to the ball, finish plays. If we fumble, we need multiple hats around the ball. We have a better chance to secure it. Well, that's not what they do. If they're in the fight, they stay in the fight. But if they're not in the fight, they're not actively trying to get involved because it slows them down. Okay, so again, the biggest one that I noticed was they had a play that was designed for a one-on-one -on -one matchup to the top. The guy on the bottom barely came off the ball, and he kind of walked almost the entire play. The ball never, the quarterback never looked at him. The ball was never coming his way. It was, you know, something that obviously was designed to take a shot over there, and they're okay with that. If the average person was watching that film, they would look and go, look how lazy the guy on the bottom is. When he's not getting the ball, he doesn't even run. 
I know that's how we graded film for a while. I would come in and tell guys, hey, look, when you're not involved in a play, you don't even get off the ball. You need to sell out every play. They don't do that. Okay, and it's partly conditioning. But the bigger part is, if this receiver busts his hump to get all the way to the other sideline, now he's got to come all the way back to line up again, and it slows him down. So that's one of the ways they play faster. Getting everybody to the spot and then the guys that need to get a signal, soon as the one thing that they notice, right, soon, the thing you notice is the guy with the ball gets it to, a, to an official. Closest official, whatever it may be, they're always trying to find a guy that spots it if they can, but sometimes you can't. So you've got to give it to the guy that's right next to you because you don't want the ball on the ground. You don't want to throw it 20 yards to an official because they may drop it, right? So that's something that tempo teams have always talked about. But it's amazing, as soon as that play ends, how quickly their skill players all turn and locate the sideline, which is something you've got to teach and you've got to work the crap out. That's why they say, hey, you don't just kind of dip your toe in the tempo world. It's all in. It's every day. It's what we do. It's the training and the coaching involved. That play ends, boom, they all go, right? But because they're all in the same vicinity, that's how they have the ability to line up quickly again. So if they were going to run the second play and it was going to be a different play, the only guys they would probably move would be the backs, right? So maybe they would bring one back over and put the other back to the other side. But the wideouts wouldn't move, and the O-line is just going to get set where they want to get set, right? So they really only have, and I was actually thinking about this from a defensive standpoint, if we want to defend tempo teams, we should probably be able to play a defense where only one or two of our guys move. Right, So some type of hybrid defense where outside backers can be strong side, weak side, field boundary. Right, The front guys can be maybe a three and a shade or a shade and a three. Because if they only have outside of the O-lineman getting set, when I say move, I mean changing sides, right? Running distances to get lined up. Well, if they only have one or two movement guys, well, then on defense, maybe we should only have one or two movement guys. Why are we trying to set the entire front and, and backers and safeties to the strength when, when they're not taking a ton of time to do that, right? So that's something I thought about defensively right away. Like, when we play these types of teams, we should probably only have one or two guys that move, and everybody else should be getting to the spot where they need to be and lining up. Now, on defense, can we ever get away with, if you're not in the fight, stay out of the fight? No, I don't think so. I don't think that's ever going to be something that we do on defense. We want to get helmets to the ball, helmets to the ball. Well, they're smart. They know that. They know that you're always going to get. So they know that your bottom side corner, linebacker safety, are all going to work angles to the football while their guys just stay where they are. So it's a conditioning deal, it's an alignment deal. You see, after that play, you'll see a backer safety corner running back over, but the wideout is already there because he didn't go get in the fight because he wasn't in the fight. Okay? So, you know, if the play started off, let's say, this way, and he's into the boundary there, he's to the field, they're wide split to the field, he's wide split to the boundary, and we're going to start it off running inside zone, work a combo to there, these two work the combo to there, if he's not a four-eye, if he's a four-eye, we might have to arc read him. But if he's there and we think we can slip, we're going to go. We're going to motion him back, all right, even if it's short motion across and then bluff and try and work out there. We're going to run inside zone, stand-up screen here, maybe an access throw or the ability versus press looks or man-to-man -to, -man to get the ball out there, right? So first play, motion involved, something going on. Usually tempo teams, it's a read process, it's an RPO, it's triple option, right, because – that's whole, the whole part of playing fast is we got to have multiple places for the ball to go because if we call the play wrong, we don't want to be dead, right? So the ball's got to be able to go. Well, the very next thing they're going to do is you can almost guarantee that these two will stay here, he will stay there, the line will get set, and maybe they'll just bring him and line up over here, and now you got three by one, all right? Or maybe he would line up out here to create three by one. So they're only going to move the back and let's say the, you know, the Y or whoever that is, hybrid, those are the only guys that really move when they're in the tempo world. All right, Now, I'm sure that they can slow down and change formations if they wanted to, but then when they're working at the warp speed, hyperspeed, they're just going to move the two guys that are closest to the core that their movement isn't all over the place. Right. So to me, and this is part of like game planning as a coach, right? if I know I'm working at that tempo and I bring the Y back here and bluff them, the very next play I'm going to call Maybe I'll just line them up over there, right? And now we'll be in tray or three by one, right? That's how I can play faster. Maybe I won't ask them to go all the way back over there. Maybe I'll line them up there, and then if I want to, if I want to go back, I can bring them back, right? Post snap, I can motion them if I want to, whatever I want to do, right? But to get the ball snap quicker, since he went over there and finished over there, let's line up in a formation that keeps him over there. That's, that's to me... What I got out of the deal, okay, and again, this is not 
Vertical run game, vertical passing game. That's the world they live in. That's their idea, right? But the tempo and the things that they're trying to do, the things that I picked up from it, besides the points of emphasis of why they do it, how they do it, okay? Usually, a, a lot of those teams, one signal, not multi-signals. Now, maybe guys are dead and they're bluffing signals, but there's really only one guy live. They don't have one or at least most of the tempo teams I've studied, they don't have one for the wideouts, one for the tight end, one for the running back, one for the quarterback. They think that's too much going on. Now, are there tempo teams out there that do that? Yeah, I'm sure there are. Okay, but it's the method of how they get lined up. It's the, the mindset and, and the play calling understanding, game plan understanding of how they want to create matchups, but knowing the play that they ended in and what they can get into next and then call your plays as quickly as possible. So like I said, if I brought a guy in motion across and he ended up over here, maybe that next formation I call, if I want to snap it as quick as possible, leaves him over there. Well, now that he's over there, and maybe it's three by one into the boundary, what things do I have in my toolbox to attack the field if I want to go back to the field, right? So that's where, as a play caller, as a tempo guy, the, that's the game within a game that you're always thinking about. They're not just thinking about that first play, but when they want to rip the tempo, I already need to know, all right, what formations can I keep that can allow me to play that fast? Where did my guys end up, and where can I move them? The tailback's always going to have to be a guy that has to either check the, check the signal, get lined up, because the, the run's over there, he runs it 15 yards, he's still got to get back to the backfield, right? He's got to get back to the backfield and line up somewhere different. So the tailback, to me, is always going to be a movement guy and a guy that you're going to have to work with. But really, if the tight end hybrid is the only other guy, per se, while you're trying to play at mock warp speed, the receivers can just stay where they are. Just stay where you are. If you're stacked, stay stacked. If you're not stacked and we get out of that, well, then maybe you come in four or five yards, but you're not changing sides. And then if your route left you over there, so like I would imagine, the next thing that would possibly happen is if they ran, if they ran a normal spread, or tri, let's say a trip set or whatever, and they ran some type of concept that got that guy across the field. Well, I would think the very next thing they may do to play fast is the next formation would probably have him lined up over there, right? So if he ran some type of high over route and ended up over here, Okay, and let's just say that guy ran post. All right, well, that guy's got to get back to that spot, right? But he stays on that side. I ran the high over, and I finished over here. Well, maybe the next formation for us to play faster keeps me on this side, right? Because that's where I ended up, all right? So maybe it's I ran the over, and I came back to line up there in a spread right or whatever your formation is, and now my two movement guys are just the tailback, all right, if this, let's, I'm sorry, if that's the slot and he's not the Y, let's say he's the H, whatever he is. Well, now the Y, wherever he ended up, needs to line up and the tailback needs to line up. So these are your two movement guys. These other guys don't have to move that much unless I call something that brings them to the other side of the field. Well, then for me as a play caller, if we want to play fast, I should probably leave him on that side of the field and not make him come all the way back to line up. So I think there's more involved in how you're calling plays than people think. All right. Um, yes, it's usually more simplistic uh, and maybe not as multiple or however you want to look at it, but I think there's more of a method to what they do and how they attack. I think the play caller knows the things that he's got in his toolbox to play at that warp speed. I can't get into nine formations and move guys all over the place. Yes, that'll stress the defense out, but we can't play with that tempo. If I want to play with this tempo, I've got to understand the formations I'm in, the things I can do out of those formations, who are my one or two movement guys? Where can they go rather quickly while I don't mess with the other guys? Or if the other guys end up with routes that bring them over there, well, maybe my next formation keeps them over there, right? So, again, the biggest thing I got from it, they all say very similar things. We want to stress the defense. We want to do something that gets us competitively at an edge or balance with the teams that off the bus recruiting numbers. We can't match them in February. We're never going to have that top signing class. We're never going to have that top five. All right, now maybe Tennessee's now in a position to get a top five class. I think Ole Miss is in a position to finish top five. But they, the one thing they talk about is we don't have those guys. We can't get those guys. They're still going to Alabama, Clemson, Ohio State, and, and Georgia. Right? We can't get them. So we got to be able to beat them. How are we going to beat them? we got to do something different, right? So stress the defense. Win with your roster. Create simple pictures. Create matchups. Get more snaps, more chances to score. That was from everybody there. Even, you know, like when Mike Norvell talked, he said, look, we don't always play that fast, but we have the ability to play as fast as anybody in the country. All right, so all those guys were saying the same type things. We want to use tempo as a weapon. We've got to live in that world. It's, a, it's not just a 
toe in the pool thing. This is how we play. This is how we lift. This is how we train. This is how we practice. It's constantly embedded. And, and you will give, even in our drills, you will give the ball to an official. You will look back for a signal. Like all those things are being coached over and over and over again. And really after this clinic, I, like I said, I've been a proponent of tempo for the last 10 to 15 years. Did we ever play that fast? No, and that's my fault. Do I think you can play that fast in high school? Yes. Do I think you can use those splits all the time? No, because I don't know if we can make those throws with the quarterbacks we have, right? So maybe we have to stress the defense in a different way. But I was never able to play at that warp speed like that just because formationally some of the things that I was doing in my system weren't conducive to that. And as a play caller, I knew where my guys were and how long it might take us to, to line up in a formation. But some of those other little caveats, like only two guys moving, what's the next formation you can present after a play that brings a guy across the field, right? <laughs> to me, those are the things that you should be looking at in the tempo world. And now that I'm just a defensive coordinator, I start looking at that and going, okay, well, if they can create a system like that and we have to defend it, what's our best bet? How do we come up with a hybrid system that is very, all right, simplistic in nature with our alignment? We only have one or two guys that got to move this far. Everybody else can stay where they are, all right? Again, we're never going to be able to teach if you're not in a fight, stay out of the fight. We're never going to be able to teach that. That's, that's an offensive deal that they figured out, and they live with it, whether it looks like they're lazy, whether they're not getting helmets around the ball for the ball carrier, whatever it is, that's what they think makes them play faster. And obviously, it works because they play pretty darn fast. Defensively, I don't think we're ever going to be doing that. Our guy's going to run the ball. We're going to get hats to the ball. But maybe from an alignment standpoint, our base deal is – this side, where you belong, let the receivers dictate the coverage, and we only have two guys in the middle, maybe a nickel and a, and a middle safety or maybe a free safety or whatever it is. Limit the number of guys that we're moving around so that we can kind of match the tempo. I don't think we'll ever be able to match it on defense. They control the pace. They control what they do. But I think we can start coaching that way and doing drills where we make our defense. Okay, guys, 15-yard run. We're going to end up there on these pursuit angles. The whistle blows. Stop. Okay. Ball's going to be spotted here. Get where you are. Back to where you need to be. Go. Look at the sideline. Get the signal. I think we can do all those things, right? I mean, I, I spend half my time in practice yelling eyes to my defense. All 11 guys, eyes, turn, look, look. That's something we have to work on anyway. So I think when I look at this, not only, you know, do I love studying it because I want it to be, and we were a tempo team, weren't anywhere as effective as they are by any means, but it was always a way for me to play. I always thought it evened up the playing field against teams that were better than us. So I've always tried to be that way. So I like hearing it because I, like, I think it confirms some of the things that I've always thought. But now that I'm a defense coordinator, I start thinking in my head, all right, and I've been a defense coordinator for a year, but now that it's just my job, I'm not a head coach, I'm not an offense coordinator, I'm just this guy with this hat. Well, now I start thinking about, okay, well, if they can come up with that, what can we come up with on defense, right? So now it's got me thinking, and that's the whole idea. Let's get the defense to think differently. Make them think outside the box. Make them do something they're not comfortable with or something they're not used to. All right, so again, uh, Always good to go to clinics. You always come back with a couple nuggets, things that you can learn. This tempo deal and hearing Alex Golish talk about it the way they do it at Tennessee, and now he's going to try and do it at USF. Hearing the little nuggets that they won't give away, and now when people ask certain questions and they say, hey, that's part of the secret sauce, now I know how important that is. So now I'm going to research that, and if somebody will talk to me about it, try and get somebody to talk to me, because if they're not willing to give it away, that must be one of the – top two or three things that can't get out to anybody, right? Like in the old days, you would talk to guys, well, if you're a true air raid guy with the handshake and the cult, these are the two things we never talk about. If you're a true Delaware wing tee, tubby Raymond guy, these are the two things we never talk about unless you have the secret handshake, right? If they're at a clinic and they won't talk about those things, they must be pretty important. That's what I derive from it. So those are the things that I'm going to try and study. All right, so if you guys have been going to clinics, I hope they've been great. I hope you learned something. If you have anything you want to share, go ahead and share it. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. All right, make sure you ring that bell, turn the notifications on, so you know every time we do a video, every time we do YouTube Live. Uh, make sure that you go thumbs up, thumbs down. If you like the content, don't like the content, leave a comment. Every time you leave a comment, I will respond. All right, and whether it's positive, negative, I just responded to one this morning. Somebody said, we don't play TCU. I don't need a video on TCU. And I said, that's a very valid point, but you also have the ability to choose what you watch on YouTube, so just don't watch the video, right? So positive, negative, interact, that's an easy interaction. I don't think it was wrong on his part, and I don't think it was wrong on my part, but I always try and get back and respond to comments because that's what it's all about. That's what we're here for, all right? And if somebody brings something up and says, hey, look, do more videos about this, I think that's more relevant to me than that video is. Uh, sure, I'm going to listen. 
Okay, but I'm also going to give you my opinion and say, you know, there's other, when you make that comment, there's other ways. You don't have to watch videos. You, if you don't like the videos, at least I know what people don't like now. And, and again, if they don't watch another video, you hate to lose somebody, but I need to know what people like. I need to know what people want. So I love the comments. I love it if it's positive. I love it if it's negative. I think the interaction is always good. So leave a comment if you've got an idea of a video you want me to do. If you've got a clinic you went to and said, hey, I heard this the other day. I think it's great. Whatever it may be, leave a comment. If I see it, I'll respond to it, and I will make sure that that interaction goes on between us. Okay, so hopefully the offseason's going well. Middle of February, last football game last night, Super Bowl. Uh, I'll be looking at it the next couple weeks on film and seeing things that I like or things that I think can help us. Uh, I didn't really watch the game live. I've never been a Super Bowl guy. Um, that's just me personally. But uh, I will definitely be looking at it on film. I heard my wife and daughters talking about different plays. My daughter was texting me about different plays. So... Um, they watch more than I do, to be honest with you, as far as Super Bowl is concerned. But um, now football's over. There is no other game, XFL or whatever is going to start. That's great. The more football, the better. But now we're kind of in that off-season mode. We're grinding. We're working, trying to get better. So make sure you're out there all right, doing your part to get better. If you go to clinics, hopefully you get something out of it. All right, I appreciate everything you guys do for me. Thank you for being subscribers to the channel. Thank you for watching the video. Remember, you won't play well until you play fast. I will see you guys next time.